preliminary, uh, as Mariah just mentioned, and uh, you know things may change as they, the officers and detectives get further into the investigation. But that's what we have right now. Let me recap again. So we got a call from what was then an anonymous citizen stating that there were four males, one of them had a gun, threatened somebody. Officers arrived. The, when the one officer arrived, the suspect with the gun took off on a bike. Uh, he was encountered by a second officer uh, behind me, and that address was uh, in the 5,000 block of Whitecliff, where he shot the second responding officer. He ran through the field here behind me, encountered the second officer who was pursuing him, where he was shot, and he's deceased in the field behind me right now. How is the officer doing right now, the one that was injured? Don't know. He was transported. Uh, don't know his condition right now. Did he display a weapon to the second officer where he was shot, when he was shot? I don't, I don't have any of those details. I haven't looked at the body camera video. We haven't spoken to the officer. So that remains under investigation right now. Uh, you'll get all that information once we get it, okay? Is anyone arrested right now? You said there was three other suspects. We're not, we're not looking for any, any other suspects right now. Right now, the, our focus is on the, the male with the gun. Okay? Thank you. Hey, Melissa, as you can see, she's going All right, that was the very latest from San Antonio Police Chief William McManus. An officer was shot twice in what he termed the lower extremities. No idea on that officer's injuries. He was apparently one of two officers that were in pursuit of a man on a bike with a gun. That's right. Initially, it was a call for a disturbance with a gun at Lakewood. Uh, there were four men involved there, but the one uh, apparently who had the gun took off on a bike, and that's when a chase ensued. The second officer who arrived uh, to meet up with that suspect exchanged gunfire. The suspect apparently firing on the officer. The officer hit twice. Yeah, that then the suspect apparently took off into a field and one of the original officers that encountered him shot and killed that suspect, a 40 year old male that has a history with law enforcement. The chief basically saying all of this is preliminary information. It is still very early. This happening just minutes ago on the city's east side. But right now we know the suspect is dead. We know an officer was shot twice in the lower extremities. Again, we have no idea on the condition of this San Antonio police officer. We do know he was transported by EMS to a local hospital and guessing from the location of where this happened, I would guess he was taken to Brook Army Medical Center. Could be. Now, they are uh, telling us that there are no other suspects. They're not interested in making any, any other arrests in this case. Um, they're just concentrating on the man who was killed, the suspect who was killed, and, of course, on the condition of the officer. We'll bring you more information as soon as we get it. In the meantime, we also have an update on the search for a murder suspect. Yeah, 37-year-old Fernando Rojas has been arrested and charged in the murder of Serena K. Bain. She was fatally shot August 4th at a home near Loop 1604 and Roddy Road. That's near Elmendorf. The sheriff's office released information in her death last week saying they were looking for Rojas. Today, Sheriff Javier Salazar said a second victim shot by Rojas died at the hospital. He's been identified as Jonathan Kenneth Fan, a third person also shot by Rojas currently recovering in the hospital. We're going to continue with some breaking news now. The San Antonio Police Department looking for three persons of interest in an aggravated robbery. These are two of the people they're looking for. The third person is not pictured. SAPD says three people threatened an employee with a weapon at a business in the 8800 block of Cinnamon Creek. The suspects stole property and got away. Again, SAPD looking for these three people, calling them persons of interest. If you have any information, you could call 210-207-7300. The pressure is on and a recent surge in COVID-19 cases putting stress not only on our hospitals, but the staff who's calling who's being called in to help those in need. And some of the stress is coming from families and patients who are frustrated about limited visitation, the longer wait times and the ma the mask policies that are now in place. And some are taking it out on the health care workers, even at times making threats. It's hard to believe that's happening. Our Tiffany Wertz explains despite the stress, those workers still taking on the task of caring for patients. Hi. Hello. 
Um, the patient was upset because he had to wait. He became hostile. His, his mom became hostile. Chief Nurse Executive for University Health, Tommy Austin, says with longer wait times and limited visitation, People are taking it out on healthcare workers. I actually round in the lobby and I and I actually tell patients, uh, please excuse the, the wait time. Uh, we have a lot of ill patients. Uh, we are triaging the best that we can. Be above your nose. Jane McCurley, the chief nurse executive at Methodist Healthcare, shared their experience during last night's city briefing. Our staff have been cursed at, screamed at, um, threatened with bodily harm, and even had knives pulled on them. We've had to increase our security and actually called on our SAPD for very disruptive cases. She says staff are emotionally, physically, and spiritually drained. Please, when you come into our hospitals, um, be kind, be respectful. Austin says their staff are feeling the pressure. So the nurse is dealing with compassion fatigue because we've been dealing with this for over 18 months and they're frustrated. Chief Nurse Executive of Baptist Health System, Kristen Lemos, says their issues surround visitors not wanting to wear masks. We've been extremely busy with COVID patients over the last four weeks, and I think that t tensions are high. Tiffany Huertas, KSAT 12 News. Governor Greg Abbott and State Attorney General Ken Paxton filing an appeal to overturn a Bear County judge's restraining order to allow mask mandates in school. That restraining order was issued on Tuesday. However, it only remains in effect till Monday unless a local district judge extends it. It allows local governments to issue mask mandates. The Governor Abbott says the order does much more than that, saying it shatters the ability for the state to carry out a uniform response to the COVID-19 pandemic. In a response to the AG's petition, San Antonio Mayor Ron Nuremberg calls the attorney general's petition, quote, political theater. He says, quote, more important, the governor acknowledges a state of emergency, but then takes the position that the response can only be a matter of personal responsibility, end quote. More than 50 people rallying outside of the Bear County Courthouse meantime this afternoon, fighting for the rights of parents' choice when it comes to wearing a mask. The Republican Party of Bear County joining forces with anti-mask groups today to protest the new mask mandates issued by Bear County and San Antonio officials. Parents say that they don't want to co-parent with the government and they fear a mask mandate may later give way to a vaccine mandate. Every parent should have the freedom to make choices for their children. Um, and I'm just concerned that because I've made a choice that's different than what's popular or common, um, that my son's going to get picked on for that. And that's that's not fair. That's not right. Parents say they're hopeful their voices will be considered during Monday's hearing involving the temporary restraining order against the state of Texas. Dr. Ruth Bergeron last night said during the case at Q&A that masks are similar to seatbelts and parents should talk with their children about wearing a mask to increase their safety, just like they would speak to them about wearing a seatbelt. A big development on the COVID vaccine front. Meanwhile, earlier today, the CDC officially recommending booster shots for the immunocompromised. As ABC's Rena Roy explains, it comes as new cases of Delta variant are popping up and more local governments implementing mask mandates in schools. The recommendation is in. I have it and the recommendation is adopted. A CDC advisory panel voting in favor of booster shots for immunocompromised Americans, nearly 3% of the population. Experts saying for now, other fully vaccinated people are protected from severe illness, but they are watching the data with the Delta variant tearing through the U.S. We're preparing to be able to give people the booster if they need. Doctors sounding the alarm in Houston with a growing number of children contracting the virus. Our children's hospitals are full. There are children dying in our ICUs. Healthcare workers advocating for masks at a school board meeting in Houston heckled by some parents. Excuse me, sir, you're taking my time. Still, the board voting to implement the mask mandate defying the governor's ban. The Dallas County judge doing the same, issuing a ruling requiring face coverings indoors. We all need to do our part. Your liberty and freedom does not extend to harming your neighbor. Experts say the virus can easily spread in a classroom of unmasked students. If we're not wearing a mask, that contamination is building up, particularly when we're in a classroom for, for hours. To the mayors. School superintendents, educators, local leaders who are standing up to the governor's politicizing mass protection for our kids. Thank you. 
Thank God that we have heroes like you. Texas and Florida are responsible for about 40 percent of all U.S. hospitalizations. Four educators in Broward County, Florida, dying from the virus within 36 hours. Three were unvaccinated. Several major cities and school districts are now requiring proof of vaccination. Chicago is one of the latest to mandate vaccines for all public school staff. Rena Roy, ABC News, New York. In two other news at five, a chase through three counties ends with about a dozen undocumented people being handed over to authorities. The Department of Public Safety tells us the chase started in Uvalde around eight this morning. After several failed attempts and traveling through both Medina and Bear County, the truck came to a crashing stop at a farm in southwest Bear County. DPS troopers say some of the people tried to run away, but only one person actually got away. As for the driver, DPS says that person, a U.S. citizen, taken to Uvalde County to face charges. With more school districts heading back to classes on Monday, AAA Texas reminding drivers about the dangers of distracted driving in school zones. Our Samuel King joins us now. And Samuel, they've released a new PSA on this very important issue, haven't they? Yes, Ursula, a recent AAA survey found that people were less likely to ask drivers to stop using smartphones than encouraging other safe driver behaviors like seatbelt use or not driving intoxicated. So this PSA illustrates what happens when no one speaks up about a distracted driver and what happens when someone does remind a driver to put the phone down. AAA Texas spokesman uh, Joshua Zuber says the uh, afternoon hours are particularly dangerous for students with nearly one third of child fatalities occurring between 3 and 7 p.m. So drivers interacting with smartphones, they're two to eight times more likely to be involved in a crash. So when you're driving distracted, you're driving intoxicated, and you could cause the same tragedies as an impaired driver. And Zuber reminds drivers to follow the speed limit in school zones and to come to a complete stop at signs. Research shows at least one third of drivers roll through stop signs in school zones and in neighborhoods. Taking a look at traffic uh, this evening in the area, this is a 410 at Jackson Keller. Uh, looking fine, has some delays not too far from there as well as we look at the large map here. So a couple of crashes. Taking a look at I-10, uh, this is that north side showing you Jackson Keller there. Now let's take a look at some travel times on I-10, some issues, especially once you get inside 1604, 20 minutes inbound. Katie Blake is here with a look at your forecast. Hey Samuel, I don't anticipate the weather causing any issues on the roadways this evening. Check it in with our weather watchers. 93 in Lakey. Thank you, Joanne, for calling that in. 92 in Leon Springs. So another pretty toasty but seasonable day for us here as we approach the middle of August. There were a couple of showers and non-severe storms that originated down near the Gulf Coast this afternoon. They have been trying their hardest to get to the I-35 and I-10 corridors. There's really not a lot of activity, but there is one Lone shower just off to the west of Gonzales with a lightning strike there, but in and around San Antonio in Bear County, things are quiet and that's how things will stay this evening. We'll carry a very low chance of one of those stray pop up showers through about sunset. Otherwise, just warm and muggy as we wrap up your Friday. We do have rain chances in the forecast this weekend. We'll talk about that coming up in just a bit. Ursula. Thanks, Katie. School back in session. It means kids might need to access the Internet from home, but monthly Internet costs can be pricey. Up next, the new federal program that could give your wallet some relief. New at five, free or more affordable internet. During the past year and a half, we've been doing a lot more on the internet than ever. We're dependent on it. And for families that struggle to pay the bills, well, the internet was a necessity that they could not afford. Now, thanks to a temporary federal program, 12 Exercise Marilyn Moore, it says millions of Americans are going to qualify for free or reduced cost internet service. Nowadays, the internet isn't a luxury, it's necessity, especially true for kids thrown into remote learning. Like a lot of school superintendents across the country, Ray Sanchez said he was humbled to find out that 15% of families in his New York district didn't have broadband at home. So that's a significant number when you have 5,100 students. Now there is help because 64% of the families in Sanchez's district qualify for the federal free or reduced price lunch program that also 
means they're eligible for the new emergency broadband benefit program. I anticipate many, many families being able to benefit from uh, what's been offered. The program means a monthly discount of up to $50 off the internet bill. Who else is eligible? Those who lost their job or been furloughed, have an income less than or equal to 135% of the federal poverty line, use programs like SNAP, Medicaid or Lifeline, or now receive a Pell Grant. Those who qualify can also get a one-time discount of up to $100 on a laptop, desktop, or tablet. The first stop is to check the FCC website to see if your internet provider participates. You can apply through your provider or online at getemergencybroadband.org. Marilyn Moritz, KSAT 12 News. Live cam on this Friday. Yes, Friday. Some clouds out there, but really all these seem to be giving us a uh, little shade. A little shade here or there. A few of them you can kind of see out there on the left hand side of your screen. That one there is trying to grow a bit taller. Um, we've got a little bit of unstable air out there this afternoon, and that has lended itself to a couple of showers originating down near the coast trying to move closer to the I-35 and I-10 corridor, but not much to show for it really this afternoon. Let's take a quick look at your weekend forecast. We're going to talk more in detail about this, but I want to give you a quick overview. 20% chance of an isolated shower or storm tomorrow afternoon, and then a better chance of some scattered rain as we get into Sunday. So don't cancel your outdoor plans, but you may need to keep an eye to the sky at times, especially as we get into Sunday. Quickly checking on what's going on in the tropics. There have been some new developments this afternoon. We've been watching what was once tropical storm Fred now tropical depression Fred expected to impact Florida this weekend, but we've actually got a new tropical depression that formed this afternoon. This is tropical depression seven now because Fred made it to tropical storm status it got its name. Now that it's back to tropical depression status, it is holding on to its name. Once seven can intensify to tropical storm status and get a name, uh, it won't be seven anymore. So sometimes that's a little bit confusing there, but that's why we've got um, some different verbiage there for those tropical depressions. Let's start talking about tropical depression. Fred now, it is expected to re-strengthen back to tropical storm status and dump a lot of rain over portions of Florida and the deep south this weekend and early next week. But on its heels, tropical depression seven, the one that formed this afternoon, still out in the open Atlantic this evening, but over the course of the weekend, it is expected to uh, approach the windward and leeward islands, eventually uh, Puerto Rico as we get toward the end of the weekend through the next five days. It may take a similar track to Fred. So right now, no immediate threat to the Texas Gulf Coast. And of course, we'll always keep an eye on what's going on in the tropics. A look at the rainfall potential over the next week. A lot of bright colors here along Tropical Depression Fred's track. Parts of Florida could see anywhere from about four to eight inches of rain this weekend. A much different story for us here at home over the next seven days. Not a whole lot to see as far as rainfall potential goes, but a few lucky yards could pick up maybe between a quarter inch to a half inch of rain as we see some rain chances jump in mainly Sunday into Monday next week. It is steamy out there we've got some heat index readings 105 in Pleasanton 100 in Gonzales unfortunately not much in the way of rain to cool us off just some hit or miss showers and storms that have been trying to work in from the coast uh, we've got a little shower there just off to the west of 281 also a tiny shower off to the west of Gonzales uh, but things are pretty quiet including here locally uh, running through the future cast here things are going to stay quiet this evening those stray thunder showers will fizzle out as we get past sunset very quiet through early afternoon tomorrow, and then we could see a couple more pop up isolated showers and storms into your uh, late Saturday afternoon, early Saturday evening. This model wants to keep things around after sunset tomorrow. I don't think that's very likely. So again, on Saturday, Rain chances will be driven by the heat of the day and then a slightly higher coverage of some scattered showers and non severe storms as we get into Sunday afternoon. So tomorrow, Lower coverage of rain Sunday. It'll be a bit higher. So if you've got plans by the pool or on the river on Sunday, you'll want to keep that case at Weather Authority app handy, guys. Thank you, Katie. Mm -hmm. All right. If you watched Hard Knocks, you got the feeling that Dak Prescott does not like to watch from the sideline. Not at all. In fact, they had to insist he go inside so he can be checked out after he strained his shoulder. When we come back, how tough has it been for Dak Prescott not being able to be on the field after nine months of rehabilitation? He will tell us in UTSA has the NFL scouts attention coming up. 
Pro Football Coverage, powered by Davis Law Firm. After losing to the Pittsburgh Steelers in the Hall of Fame game 16-3, the Dallas Cowboys face the Cardinals in Arizona tonight in their second preseason game. And they do so without their star quarterback, Dak Prescott, recovering from a strained muscle in his throwing shoulder that he picked up back on July 28. How frustrating is it for him after it took him nine months to get back on the field after suffering the worst injury of his football career last year with a compound fracture and dislocation of his ankle? I'm a go-go-go guy. I always want to be in the, be in the action, uh, getting better. I think the more reps are, are better uh, and better for me, but obviously something like this, um, you, you, can't, you can't stress it too fast. And sitting out and um, being out of all the time I was out last year, uh, that, that's what I think about and that's what's able to um, pull me back in. And so it's just um, the risk versus the reward at this point, and I've got to, I've got to know what I'm playing for, and that, that's be ready for this season. All right, kickoff time tonight is at 9 p.m. San Antonio time. Meantime, at least two women who've accused Deshaun Watson of sexual assault and misconduct in civil lawsuits filed against the Houston Texans quarterback have complained about their interviews with the NFL investigators. According to Sports Illustrated, the two felt the women investigators were patronizing and victim-blaming. One of the women claimed she was asked what she was wearing when she met Watson. The UTSA Roadrunners continue their preparations for the 2021 season at their new race facility, which stands for Roadrunners Athletic Center of Excellence. After picking up seven wins and plenty of postseason individual player awards in Jeff Trailer's first year as head coach, they have caught the attention of NFL scouts, including the Dallas Cowboys. There are a number of players on preseason watch lists, including running back Sincere McCormick, quarterback Frank Harris, safety Rashad Wisdom, and kicker Hunter DuPlessis, just to name a few. We're three here today. We've already had three or four here. We've had somebody here every day. Uh, but every time each scout asked me about somebody different, I said he was not on the list. He was not on the list. So that's a, that's a good thing. It, and it gives the kids hope. And it makes them practice harder. It always makes them, it's, it's just, it's, it's just makes them go because they know they're over there evaluating them. And by the way, quarterback Harris is noticeably absent from practice yesterday. Trailer says he gave him the day off. Texas Special Olympics is asking for volunteers to help with the state's summer games. will be held at Morgan's Wonderland in Inclusion City, USA, September the 19th through the 21st. They need about 3,000 people to volunteer. Just go to www.southtexas.org summer games or SOTX. What a big event that's going to be for this city when it happens. Glad it's back. Indeed. Yeah, thanks, Greg. And we'll be right back. Before we go, we want to check back in on that breaking news we told you about in the beginning of the newscast. Yeah, a man dead, an SAPD officer injured, transported to a local hospital. Here's our Patty Santos on the scene. Patty. Yeah, here's what we're seeing right now. Police are using their uh, dogs to search the field that you're seeing right behind me there, uh, possibly for evidence and maybe even the weapon. We know that one officer was injured twice. This was a call for a disturbance with uh, possibly one of the suspects carrying a gun. When an officer arrived, police say that suspect opened fire on uh, the the officer. Uh, a second officer then was able to, to chase that suspect uh, right into this field here where we're told that uh, second suspect opened fire on, uh, excuse me, that uh, officer op opened uh, fire on that uh, suspect. And that's what the information that we have right now. We know that the uh, um, officer was taken to the hospital. We'll bring you more uh, coming up on the night beat.